Hello, the, <laughs> the ciliospinal reflex. Wow, I'm really going for the views, aren't I? Uh, the ciliospinal reflex is um, one of those reflexes that isn't commonly taught in medical school. It's not part of the OSCE exam, but it is something that comes up. It is something that can be useful and does get used. And because it's not really taught, it can be confusing. So because it's not very common, I shouldn't really spend too much time on this, but what I should do is tell you what the reflex is and tell you the anatomy of the reflex arc, because then what you can use it for will make more sense. And given that it's called the ciliospinal reflex, how much is the Brian actually involved? Ciliospinal reflex. Okay, well the cilio bit actually refers to the eye. Ciliary Latin eyelashes. So cilio eye, cilio spinal, uh, spinal cord. So what's going on? Well, the ciliospinal reflex, if you cause pain to the neck, maybe like the upper torso, like the top of the neck, or to the face, the pupil on the same side will dilate one or two millimeters. It's a rapid response and it's a rapid reflex. It occurs in people that are awake, that, that are asleep, that are comatose, and it's mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. So it's a little bit of a test of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, if you're testing the skin at the face, that's gonna be mediated by the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five. So that is gonna make use of a reflex, a relay in the brainstem. But if you're testing the skin of the neck, it actually might not incorporate the brainstem. So let's have a look at that. This is one of those reflexes. I don't... Let's start at the end, let's start at the eye. So the pupil is the hole that light passes through to get to the retina. So the diameter of the pupil is regulated to regulate the amount of light falling on the retina. And we have sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves working together or in opposition to, to manage that. So there's a muscle that will constrict the pupil Pupillary constriction is caused by sympathetic innervation. Um, and there's another muscle which will dilate the pupil and that's under the control of sympathetic innervation. So whilst there is some interplay, and we've talked about the anatomy of this in the anatomy of the eye and also in the pupillary light and pupillary dark reflexes. So have a look at those for more detail. This is part of that, but doesn't necessarily act in isolation. So for the sensory limb of the reflex, we actually have two routes to consider. And this is about pain, this is about nociception. So the skin of the neck, you cause pain, so cutaneous pain sensors, carry that pain information back to the spinal cord through cervical spinal nerves and into the lateral spinal thalamic tract and off up to the brain, you feel it in now. Um, so that's passing to the spinal cord and potentially up. Whereas in the face, now we're in the territory of cranial nerves. So in the face, causing pain in the face, that sensation is carried by the trigeminal nerves. So the trigeminal nerve has got three branches. This is the fifth cranial nerve and it has one, two, three branches, the ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular branches. So one of them, depending upon where you elicit the pain, will carry that sensation back to the brainstem. So here's the brain, the cerebrum, and here's the brainstem down here. There's the medulla, the pons and the midbrain. The trigeminal nerve enters the brainstem at the pons here. It's a big stalk. And pain fibers typically enter the spinal trigeminal nucleus. So there's a, there's a long strip of nuclei within the brainstem that are receiving sensory inputs from the trigeminal nerve. So I assume in this relay, the pain fibers go in there because nobody's really described it in any more detail. Um, so that's the sensory input. So pain from the face, trigeminal nerve, 
goes into the pons and the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Pain from the neck, cervical nerves, goes into the spinal cord. Those are the sensory limbs, the afferent limbs, the sensory inputs to the reflex. In terms of the motor limb, we'll come back to the reflex bit in a, in a minute, but in terms of the motor limb, the efferent bit, we've only got to get to the dilator pupillae muscle in the eye. So you might think that, oh right, if we're, if we're at the brainstem, we don't have to go very far to get to the eye. But if you know your sympathetic nervous anatomy, you'll know there's a, there's a bit of a way to go. Um, here is a model of the chest. I've taken out the right lung and we're looking into the, the right side. Uh, and here we have the sympathetic trunk, the sympathetic chain. So essentially sympathetic nerves come out of the spinal cord in thoracic levels, run to the sympathetic trunk and then run off to all parts of the body from there, which means we actually have to go back down the spinal cord, out here, and then back up into the head to get to the eye. So it's a heck of a loop. And there's another structure we need to consider first. Here is a transverse section through the spinal cord. We see the gray matter, the gray matter in the middle, and the white matter around the outside. And we see nerves coming in uh, and going out to form the spinal nerve there. Um, and we have this dorsal horn, this is the back, posterior, this is ventral, anterior. We have a dorsal horn and a ventral horn of the grey matter. And in the thoracic levels, there is a lateral horn. And in here, we have the cell bodies of the preganglionic sympathetic neurons. And at levels T1 and T2 of the spinal cord, in this lateral horn here, we have something called the the ciliospinal center or budges center named after the originator, named after the person who first described this reflex. So this is where the crux of the matter is. The, the neurons here, these preganglionic sympathetic neurons in the ciliospinal center at level C1, T1 and T2 are gonna pass out posterior thoracic wall, posterior neck, posterior abdominal wall down there. There's the spinal cord. This is the sympathetic trunk. So preganglionic sympathetic fibers from that ciliospinal center in the lateral horn of the gray matter of the spinal cord at levels T1 and T2 will send out their preganglionic sympathetic motor neuron axons out to the sympathetic trunk and they'll pass up to the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. So they're passing up the sympathetic chain and then they will sign up. So in that ganglion, of course, we've got cell bodies of the postganglionic sympathetic neurons. So the preganglionic sympathetic neuron will sign up with the postganglionic sympathetic neuron. And those neurons will then run up the neck to get to the brain and they do that by following the major blood vessels. So those sympathetic neurons will run up the outside of the common carotid artery and the internal carotid artery and by doing that they will make their way inside the cranial cavity and they'll end up just posterior to the eye and they'll, they'll dive through the superior orbital fissure to get into the orbit and those postganglionic sympathetic neurons will run to the eye to the dilator pupillae muscle where they can cause dilation of the pupil. Now, normally, here's, here's the half of the brain. There's the brain stem again. Up here we have the hypothalamus. Pituitary, hypothalamus, thalamus. And there are neurons in the hypothalamus which are the first part of that sympathetic outflow. So normally cells in, from the hypothalamus will send sympathetic fibers down to those preganglionic sympathetic fibers in the spinal cord and trigger all of that, right? Um, so then in terms of, so we need the, the middle bit of the reflex now, we need to join up the sensory input with the motor output. So in the face, the sensory input then you cause pain in the face, trigeminal nerve carries pain fibers back into the brain stem. So assumably then there's a link to those hypothala hypo to, the, to the sympathetic fibers in the hypothalamus, which then trigger 
that sympathetic pathway to cause the pupil to dilate on the same side as the pain stimulus. So the brainstem is involved, right? Because the spinal trigeminal nucleus is in the brainstem, the hypothalamus is up here. Um, whereas, if you cause pain in the skin of the neck, that sensory information runs into the spinal cord and it seems that that information can interact directly with the ciliospinal center in the spinal cord at T1 and T2 levels and then cause the outflow, the sympathetic outflow from there to cause pupillary dilation. So that doesn't necessarily include the brainstem. It's a spinal reflex, the ciliospinal reflex. What does this mean? Horner's syndrome is described as drooping of the eyelid, um, constriction of the pupil, and a loss of sweating on the side of the face. This usually happens on one side, all of those things on the same side, and those are all a result of um, a loss of sympathetic innovation to that region of the face. Horner's syndrome. So, because the ciliospinal reflex is using that sympathetic outflow, the sympathetic bit is the motor bit, right? If somebody is suspected of having Horner's syndrome, the ciliospinal reflex will be absent in someone with Horner's syndrome because the motor limb will not be intact. Horner's syndrome then can be caused by pathology in the chest, compressing those sympathetic nerves, or pathology in the neck compressing those sympathetic nerves. However, if you were to test the face, we said that that reflex is happening in the brainstem, which means that it can be used as one of the tests to see if the brainstem is intact, to see if the cells there are functioning and to determine um, brainstem death. So if you test the skin of the face, you're testing the integrity of the brainstem. If you test the skin of the neck in the ciliospinal reflex and you look to see if that pupil dilates, you are not necessarily testing the brainstem. You may well just be testing the spinal reflex. So that is the ciliospinal reflex. That is its anatomy and can you see now why it might be useful but it's not part of a typical battery of tests. Um, but there you go. Ticked. <laughs> It's, it's interesting. And we've been looking at brainstem reflexes for a number of weeks now. So it starts to tie some of those other parts of the brainstem that we've been looking at together in a slightly different way. All right, I thought that was interesting. See you next week. <laughs>